Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT races to discuss their lives, their journeys, their ambitions, and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. I'm Chris Pritchard, and with me, Steve Plater. Steve, it's not going to take a rocket scientist. If they're watching on TT+, Plus, they'll see we're not in the usual studio. Where are we? The Isle of Man. Woohoo! The land of dreams. Well, for most of these riders we're talking to anyway. Where dreams are made. So if you do hear any um, pitter-patter of rain or people shouting or beeping outside, then just know that we're not in the usual studio. Steve, we've got an exciting guest coming up today. Uh, I've seen loads of interviews with James. He's he's not a... F- you don't he's not afraid of showing his feelings is he yeah quite outspoken shows his emotions mm-hmm. and it's very easy going he doesn't really come across as a, a, a you know as a, a tough guy or a tough competitor even however he's very fast yeah if you saw him walking down the street you had a quick chat with him you wouldn't think that he was capable of doing what he's capable of doing right no nope. a tt winner a tt winner let's get him on Today's guest is part of the furniture at the TT. He's been competing on the island since 2008. He's had 64 starts and he's finished a staggering 60 of those. His first win came in the 2013 lightweight race and he's amassed 14 podiums as well as a fastest lap time of 132.141 miles an hour back in 2015, making him the seventh fastest man ever around the course. At this year's TT, it took us a while to recognise James out of the green we've grown so used to seeing him in, as he jumped ship to the OMG Rich Energy team. Now we'll get the story firsthand from James as to how his TT went in 2022 shortly. A man who's almost as famous for that moment over Balagheri as he is for his consistency around the TT course. James Hillier, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi. How was that intro? Uh, good. Seamless? <laughs> <laughs> No comment. <laughs> right, you've clearly listened to thousands of the podcasts, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know the first question. Oh, no, sorry. No, I actually, oh uh, I think I've listened to John's one just, just early John's. in the, which was one of the first, wow. yeah. So I've forgotten. I mean, that hurts sort. a little bit, I'm not going to lie. Sorry. There's a lot of them out now and I, I just, uh, yeah, no, but if, no offence. But if just, you had to say which one was your favourite, it'd be the TT podcast, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's a little... Well, yeah. yes will suffice <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't say too much because we got one in the team as well so it's, it's good it's very oh, good Dave podcast. is good Dave yeah. is good yeah, he actually so. had me on as a guest oh. I was actually a guest I know James is laughing so was everybody else yeah I haven't listened to that breath. one either so I can't I've never been asked <clears throat> can't get my breath it's just superstars they want <laughs> obviously anyway <laughs> the first question we always ask the TT riders when they come here yep. is that moment, that tap on that shoulder, the flag goes up. You've ro- you know you have originally rolled through. You get that tap on that shoulder. Kind of in that moment of what we call no man's land. Take yourself there now. What's going through your head? How are you feeling? Do you feel prepared? Are you ready to go? Or is the mind almost empty at that point? I think it's um, it's. Do you know, I've never. It's a good question, really. I've never <clears throat> considered it probably in depth but it is almost must be <clears throat> you go into battle you know it's like you're you're going out the bunker and into into war it, you, it, you, it's a little unknown you've got obviously ambitions and intentions of how you want it to go and what you want to do but you there's that that little bit of unknown and um, you almost forget that as soon as the you start riding you forget that it just turns in, into race mode but it's that that probably <clears throat> the last minute really when you roll up there is weirdly calm for me is is weirdly calm I, I'm quite excited but not not too nervous because you're in you know once you're there there's no going back that's yeah. uh, that's you can't sort of put your hand up and say oh, sorry no not 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 for me I'm I'm out but you know that is that that's where you have to step up and uh I I I I like it I love that part really when it's when you know what you're about to be doing is, uh, which is an amount of fear and, and nerves, but more excitement for me. That's amazing because you speak. I think I think it was John, right? It was John that said it's the last place he wants to be, and a few people have said that mm-hmm. that it's the last place you want to be, which is strange because the moment that flag drops, everyone says the same thing: nerves have gone, yeah. everything's gone. We're just thinking, like you say, almost going into battle. And the clutch comes out of your hand. 
What's your first thoughts? Um, just get, go as fast as I can, <laughs> as quickly as possible, and. Uh, I don't, yeah. I just, I'm, it's of interest to me, obviously, yeah. but it's just because we ask so many different, like Dean Harrison was surprised because <clears throat> I hated Bray Hill. Really? He loves it. It's his favourite part of the track. Yeah, but, I, but I, I, just... I, look, I mean, I preferred the old old routine when we had no warm up lap. I think it's, it's for me, it's, it's not not ruined it at all, but it's it was better when it was, that was was a massive part of the TT for me. It was going from, you know, sometimes you have two or three days off as it's been, been bad weather. Um, and then you just, bang into that is like nothing like you know it's like it's almost like a bungee jump or something isn't it into and then uh, <clears throat> up by Agos you're sort of ready you're done you know you're like you're in then it's woke you woken up and uh, on your way but I uh, yeah I, I think it's hard to explain but I think most of the TT fans especially you know they they quite obviously understand how emotional you get at the end of a race and quite and you're not shy to show it of course are you that flipping emotional when you set off at the start of the race um total opposite at the start really yeah weird i don't i don't i think it just maybe i, I block it off and then maybe that's why it floods a bit at the end because yeah, I've, yeah. I've sort of isolated it and, and let it put it aside and then it comes out um at the end you know it, it, i can't uh you know it, it you know i don't think anyone can particularly call me a, a wuss for maybe shedding a tear at the end you know that that was really special that senior race for me to like um you know a, 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 and you, you know as, as 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 i do but um when you start racing there and you ride past that winner's enclosure you just look in and you think god that's that is the dream isn't it to pull in there so that year 15 when i pulled in there with john and hutchie it just my head fell off a bit really i was blew my mind and and shocked myself and I don't know. I didn't just didn't probably expect it. Really, you know, it was uh, like like often dreams. You never really you hope they're going to come true, but when they do, it's quite quite uh, nice. <laughs> and are you an emotional person anyway? Away from riding, you know, I what, think your 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 missus does she look at you like that and think, well, you never show your flipping emotions. That's what mine says. <laughs> yeah, I think it depends <laughs> what the subject too. is. You know, if it's uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes I could be what weirdly watching a film with the kids, and it'd break me a bit at the end when the turns and the, and the sad bit comes on. I'm like I'm sat behind them, like trying to, <laughs> trying to what was he? We've all cried, Moana. Yeah, mate. No, no, there's no shame it, in that. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. So I, I, I'm a bit soft, I think. But you know, I, I think I, I'm soft generally. But on a motorbike, I'd say I'm pretty tough. So I don't. I don't yeah. It's what it is. So yeah, what, yeah. There's not many riders that that can show those kind of two emotions. Yeah. Like you are clearly a fearless competitor, a warrior, an athlete, however you want to put it. And then on the other side, you, you, you're more than capable of n not just bottling up your, your, your feelings. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it doesn't really make sense if I'm honest, you know, I don't, I don't. don't. Maybe it does, maybe that's, maybe, yeah, maybe maybe that's a better it, way of being a bit more balanced. Yeah, but I think it, for me, it's, it's, it's that whole roller coaster, you know, from yeah. I'm, I'm like, points I'm really excited then I'm scared and nervous and then I'm like in the zone and determined and hungry and nothing will stop me and then and then at the end it all crashes and, and falls apart so it's it it um it's that the whole journey I suppose emotional journey of, of racing at the TT and every, everybody's different how about you Steve like I I it, mu it there must be a point of every TT rider when they get home like you whether it's in the winner's enclosure when you just release that emotion or it's not until you get home have you ever experienced it where you've just it, because it's there's so many emotions going on and everyone's just at the peak of emotions whether it's fear or excitement or whatever it is you've got to have that drop yeah, surely I've had, <clears throat> not so much the drop but you know for me the emotion is the winning yeah you know whether it uh, uh, any discipline um, and still is now. You know, it can I can look back at a, a race, you know, especially some coverage, um, and it kind of makes you emotional, especially some of the things you had to go through sometimes to to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. Right. Before we get into your career as a TT rider, right from the start, I feel like we should just make reference to the fact that you could potentially hear some rain on the on the roof. We're not in our original studio, Steve. Tell them where we are right now. <sighs> best place on the planet the Isle of Man obviously mm -hmm. you know um, yeah a different studio different surroundings same people really you and I Chris still amazing quality podcasting from the crew and obviously a new guest James you're the first one this week 
we're cramming quite a few in because all the guys are here obviously oh, cramming quite a few in this week while we're here for the manx classic i'm not sure what it's officially called Who knows? Uh, but anyway Ma- let's call it my gp um just tell us james you know i haven't seen you for a little while um what's a day in the life of james hillier <laughs> for all the race fans what what's uh, how does your life you know obviously you're involved now with it with ong and stuff things have changed a little bit but what's a day in in your life oh i don't know where to start i um and i know I, I sort of, I sort of <clears throat> i don't put a whole lot on social but I, you know i've got a wife and three kids and a, and a, a renovation bungalow we're turning into a house so i'm pretty in you know that's that's taken over a lot of our lives at the moment but um primarily is uh i'm a uh, rich energy omg rider for the for the roads and a little bit of off-road stuff um and then i've been working part-time at crescent yamaha which is literally up the road from me in verwood uh, uh, on the hampshire dorset border um uh, race bikes or road bikes but bit of both to be honest uh, more track bike stuff but um just working with customers on on track builds and um bike specs and um quite interesting and it kind of all worked out because it, when i started working there we were still bmw with uh, omg and the yamaha thing came on and it's all sort of falling in place quite nicely so working with the yamaha brand and helps a little bit trying to you know when you're trying to sell a yamaha and push a yamaha which is a little bit harder if you're riding a bmw but we're so that's clear and and, and uh, i enjoy that it's it's five minutes up the road and a fair fair bit of potential i think there in the in the, in, in in that in the future of that side of the business the, the pro shop but uh and then uh this the absolute slog of trying to do a house up which is hard you know it is uh it looks it looks easier when you get the plans drawn and so yeah, on so, so two questions are yeah. you a mechanic in at, at crescent uh i try not to get on the spanners too much right. it's um we've got fully trained qualified technicians there <laughs> you point them in the right that. direction yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah so so um but um real mechanics yeah right. yeah so i have i have got man's dirty a few times when needed but um we organized a, a track event early in the year in uh, spain which was really really successful actually with you know 30 we had 35 people there on a open pit lane track day through crescent and um it, it push more things like that really just yeah. trying to bring a, a group of customers together that all share the same passion and and you know they can talk about who's got better bikes and this bit works and that bit doesn't in blah blah, blah. so it um yeah I, I enjoy that side of it really and and putting a a sort of sensible head on trying to sort of look ahead a little bit into where I might want to go in in life with when one day I do stop racing here which I haven't I've thought about it but I'm not really intending on on stopping yet it uh, still got boxes to tick and uh, my body's still working enough at the moment so we'll <clears throat> yeah I just open open eyed really just trying to sort of look out and do as many things as I physically can you know and tick as many sort of bucket list boxes off as well at, at, at the same time Chris on, on that sorry Chris on the competitive side you know yeah you've always been known from from me really I suppose um, in green Bournemouth Kawasaki yeah P Extance you know why why the change why, why did you move away not just from the brand but obviously from from the Bournemouth Kawasaki um, it, it was ab- absolutely no reason of, of feeling like I I uh, they were the, you know they, it wasn't like they were holding me back because we had the, the the stats speak for themselves with the finishes and reliability and the you know we weren't slow at all with the Kawasaki but it was more for me and, and I had an open conversation with Pete at Bournemouth about that and it, it, I mean I nearly left a couple of years ago on two occasions and Pete managed to like we worked it out and I sort of slept on it and and there was a point actually where I'd, I'd agreed to ride probably three years ago maybe I'd I'd sort of agreed to ride another for another manufacturer <clears throat> told pete slept on it and i woke up in the morning and i just felt wrong so i phoned i switched it all back i said look sorry i can't do it phone pete and said look let's carry on and you know it just didn't feel right and um but it was something i always wanted to i don't want to <clears throat> end finish or retire from road racing and have never ridden another manufacturer you know i knew it was it wasn't going to be easy and um or straightforward but i just I didn't want to one day finish racing and then spend the rest of my life thinking, God, when, what if I'd have just tried another bike or, you know, it, it just, it was just, I just had to try something. So it was, 
yeah, it's not definitely not the easy route, but you know, it uh, Pete Pete totally understood that, and and you know, it wasn't a case of like, you know, trying to up the offer or or, or a haggle. It was it was just for my sort of sanity, really. So regardless of what Pete, how many zeros he'd put on that end of that check, you would <laughs> you would go in. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'd have thought about it if he'd put a few zeros on, but no, it uh, it, it it was um, it wasn't a monetary thing really. Yeah. It was more for my for my feeling, and um, which you know it, it was. I think it, it was. It I think it was. It wasn't easy. This TT. It never would have been on 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 switching bikes you know you don't i don't think i fully appreciated having a, a whole the amount of data and, and and sort of setup we had with the kawasaki until um until i kind of got on on the m high and by no means was it a bad bike the potential is very good but it just it's the whole process of just ticking boxes working through setup and finding that kind of good feeling with a bike you know is yeah. uh it's hard especially when around here with limited laps and track time it uh it's, it's tough so yeah, well, let's we may as well jump into TT twenty twenty two while we're here. Um, by your standards, probably didn't go the way you wanted to. But like you say, you've you, you turn up on a brand new bike with a brand new team, and you've got zero data, and that's quite interesting. That point of the fact that you've got no data, no one's really performed on a Yamaha around here. You know, you look at BMW, you could you could find enough information from other people, but when it comes to Yamaha, you're almost with a blank page starting from scratch. Is that how it felt? <laughs> Um, can, I, can I just jump in there? You because, you know, they're world superbike champions, they're British superbike champions. Um, they're not doing bad at MotoGP, so why couldn't you make it before around the street? <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> no, I, you know, it, and that, that was one I was super excited to be coming here on the MR because it was so proven. And, yeah. and, and, and I knew possibly in some sections it might be harder work. I was, I was worried maybe it wouldn't quite be stable enough, which it actually was, but, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to sort of hold back on here too much because I'm not. I don't feel like I'm. I'm just being honest with how yeah. how the bike worked, and you know the 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 bike is absolutely proven and and it's dominating BSB and uh, um, it was just finding that kind of balance of, of of with the chassis more than anything. The engine on that Yamaha is so nice. You know, it sounds amazing, but it it, it the the torque and the way it just delivers the power. It kind of tricks you because you you feel like you need to to really rev it, but the the a lot of the power is low down, so you can kind of be a bit lazy with it. Really, it feels slow, but it's actually Fr friendly still power. really friendly. You know, it was. Um, I mean, the super bike was. We actually took power out of it in a, in a number of gears just to sort of soften it and make it a little bit easier to ride. But um, it's that little, it's that last probably like four percent of setup. You know, which is crucial here for the. Like <clears throat> years ago, I think Joey said the the corners with no names is where you make a lot of the time up, and that's. I feel that for me was, you know, it's the little kinks bef around Renkullen and towards Balaf where where it, I just couldn't quite hold the throttle on like I know I should have been able to and just trying to keep the bike turning at high speed. It was such hard work at times. And I think, um, and we got it, we got it a lot better. You know, I felt the, the senior race at the end of the week was, you know, I wish that had been the first race and we would have had a much better week. I kind of felt we'd, made headway for sure by the end of week but um just uh just couldn't quite sort of finesse it that final bit you know it was we were a little bit behind and i think majority of the guys you know apart from the new honda they they all stepped back on a bike as they finished in 19 you know yeah. which you know we were we were changing the bike every session every race we were even trying stuff before a race nothing major but just small changes to try and help and then and and, and uh, also, I was in a little bit of a battle between: is it the bike? Is it me from not having not ridden here? And yeah. then that—that's that. And I think a number of riders struggled a bit with that this year. Was kind of, you know, they might be trying to convince themselves it's the bike, but really you just got to man up and hold the thing on. You know, it. Um, so you know, and I, and I was open with the team and said, look, the the bike. You know, and even the the tire, the Man, uh, Metzler tires. We've had a, a, a chat since about development for next year. And I said, to be honest, the tyres this year were, were better than me I, I just didn't get the best out of my package so I was frustrated to be honest after this TT because it, I put a lot of effort in before to sort of be in a good place but you you can you know to to, to be um, not satisfied with five finishes you know I think we're top seven, 
top seven, I think, in all mm-hmm. races. But or some, I can't even remember. I've sort of I've remembered the important bed. bits, but I, it wasn't. It was not results. I sort of want to remember. I don't come here to finish seventh. You know, it, it was very frustrating. But at times, but overall, I think. Um, pretty pretty good you know I think we did we finished every lap of practice every every race we finished and the races we started anyway so um, we're allowed to start so it uh, yeah I, I just you know and I get the feeling people say oh you had an alright TT and I sort of feel a bit ungrateful really because it should be but as a racer, you don't, you're never happy with finishing seventh. You know, yeah, you want to yeah, be. I, I, I wouldn't have thought you'd have been, you'd have been happy in the slightest with, mm. with that. But then again, you are on a brand new bike. Yeah, you, you, you're back after three year break, so. I think the the brake thing, everyone's in the same boat, so I can't yeah. use that excuse. You're you're renowned for being a slow starter through the TT and building up gradually through to you know race week. Yeah. Do you think that hindered you being on the new brand and a, you know a massive Poss- amount of work to do? Possibly. You know, I think I remember first night on the Superbike and I was like, wow, like, how what the hell are we going to do this? Because the lap times were pathetic and, it, and we're nowhere near what we could do. And it, and, and it felt so fast because you just, there's no way to prepare for that or get in that, to get that feeling, you know, when, when you, at the end of Cronky Body or something, and you know, even halfway along Cronky Body, you feel like you're going fast and then you, you click sixth and you're like, it's like... <laughs> what the how what why is it so fast like and and uh <laughs> and then but by the end of the race yeah at the end of race week you 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 absolutely want more you know it's crazy how you adapt and 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 that speed becomes somewhat normal is 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 incredible how do you ever get used to that at the end of race week it's odd it's so bizarre how Everything you can, slows down yeah yeah really and that that's sort of where you want it to get that's what you're aiming for but it, it, it you can't force it you know yeah. you, it just takes laps and time and, and you know that all that all comes hand in hand with having the you know it, if you have a bike that isn't handling it takes longer to get that feeling because it's it's not doing what you want it to do as soon as you can get it the bike feeling comfortable and it fully in control then then that feeling comes a lot quicker so it, it's, it's a it's a tough little process to kind of and the harder you try to force it, the almost further away it goes. Yeah. Did it, did it make life? Sorry, Chris. Sorry. Did it make life harder, uh, not having Davo there? Definitely. Yeah. He, he. To be fair, he would come in after a lot of sessions and and give a bit of feedback and say everyone's r- struggling there or something. That made me feel better because like Solby straight this year is terrible. You know, it used to be a bit of a rest, but you know, one lap my feet were off down there and I didn't really. I, I was offline because I was beside Hutchie, but the I was like. Phew, it, it, it wasn't there was a lot less rest in a lap yeah. this year with the, the the way the tracks changed it was pretty tough to you know bits you'd sort of almost look forward to for a little bit of a breather were <laughs> not any longer they were uh they were they were hard work so what do you do with the, I, I was going to ask exactly the same question yeah, sorry, to be man. fair because the thing is when you look at like bsb or something you've got two teammates going mm-hmm. around the same course and they can just interject with with information but obviously this is slightly different because of the way it's set up and obviously Davo was a much bigger rider than you but also did you feel pressure knowing that you were the only Yamaha um, to, to a degree to, I was as a matter of pressure because I'm represent represented the team yeah. and brand myself but um you know I think with with Davo we would have almost we would have massively accelerated the the development mm-hmm. during that practice week of you know we would both go out with different settings discuss the the feelings we got and then it would give us a, a more of a direction rather than you know you can say if you're in the middle and one rider goes up and the other rider goes down with something yeah and it's going to be right one way or the other and then you that rather than it take you know it's then you could even do that in 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 one lap so it uh one evening's practice you both go out for a lap with either way of setting come back in and then you, that night you've changed whereas from us if i was being on my own we had to kind of do it one step at a time rather than with two riders you can really move forward with with setup and, and trying stuff you I know, guess if just, you go the wrong way with it it's I mean it, it just accentuates it even that to, to a degree or, or we could try you know one evening Dave could have gone out with a with a front setting change and I could have gone with rear because sometimes you end up chasing the wrong end of the bike or even even fuel maps and um, fuel tanks you know to get make sure we've got the, the longevity and the, the fuel range and there's, there's so much you know that we could have uh, moved we were, we, we were I'm not by any means making excuses but we, it would have TT would have been a little bit easier with Dave on the bike yeah. and uh, 
it, so I was, as soon as I heard he wasn't coming, I was pretty peed off really because, you know, I knew it was down to me then to kind of learn the bike. And um, but you know, I think you know we've got a long list of stuff. Um, how we, where we want it next next year and uh, provided we're, we're on for next year I haven't actually had the conversation with him yet oh, I was like the next question <laughs> yeah I'd like to think you know I want to finish the job we started and, and yeah, hopefully yeah. we can pull it all together and, and um, you know because that 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 bike was a was so some sections of the course on, especially on the mountain it was so nice that bike to ride and the R1 just uh, you know I never really I never got to ride the Superstock bike properly here, but the the superbike alone, it didn't really feel like a superbike, you know. It was, uh, which is nice. It's kind of sound yeah. might sound silly, but it was just, it was comfortable. The engine's nice and torquey. It was kind of, kind of, almost a bit of a lazy bike, which I think would probably might suit my style a little bit more around here. Now, it was widely publicised that you were going to be doing the TT of the off-road world, yeah. which is the Dakar. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, why? why not <laughs> I'm a massive uh, fan and I very nearly competed them myself you know I went to the start of the cancel one years ago and so on um, but it didn't happen in the end wow. um, however you know it's a massive task you know and when it puts the wind up people like David Knight a multiple world champion you know it's a tough it's a tough uh, discipline to go and compete at yeah I think uh, I can't I've just got this burning like desire to do hard stuff you know or things that not not I don't, weirdly, I don't think I'll in particularly enjoy it that much, but <laughs> I, 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 you will have to I'm win. still so hungry to do it, you know, and just get to the finish because it... it um, Which is a huge, a massive, huge task. Absolutely massive, yeah. you know, and I won't be, by all means, I won't be there racing. I'll be there riding and and just concentrating on, on keeping the wheels turning to get to the end and I'll hopefully touch wood, I can, I can do that and I'm either going to never want to do it again um, but tick a massive box or I'll think, wow, you know, that is, I want to come back next time and, and, and do better. So it's, it, it, you know, it's bloody dangerous, that job. It is, you know, this is, this is pretty sketchy riding around, around here, but, you know, I've done a few, two rallies now, one in Spain, which was more dirt track. That was, that wasn't too bad to be honest, but the, the second was in Abu Dhabi in the dunes and that, 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 that can change so quickly there from, from, riding along a, a steady flat sort of almost trail in the sand and then almost an instant drop which is like riding off a multi-story car park it, and and you you if you don't die you're definitely going in the air you know in the air med to to get salvaged i don't know it just it, 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 it and so you're and you can't read it so well i think the more as as that was only a five-day rally and as it went on i i wasn't still taking risks but I could I was assuming what was because you you almost don't read it from straight in front you look at the sides almost and read the ju the shape of the dunes yeah. beside so I'd at the beginning I was kind of rolling everything and, and, and thinking what the hell's over here whereas and uh, sorry mate are, are these uh, things you're approaching obstacles flat in top gear um, often you spend a fair bit of time flat in top but Looking I'd out. say more four fifth gear yep, uh, yep. which is still probably uh, sort of 70 mile an hour you know you're not going slow it's uh, it, it, it doesn't feel that quick because it's, there's no real reference you know until yeah. you've got to stop for a drop you know and then, <laughs> then you realise how fast you're going but you know they're, they're sand dunes but they're honestly like mountains some of them they're, it is you, you can't appreciate it till you see it and uh, it is it's a mind blowing thing the more I sort of got into it the more I wondered what the hell I was doing you know it's so I can't in my opinion explain. you know the Dakar is far more dangerous than the TT yeah. for sure yeah. yeah sorry guys I I mean I know what the, the Dakar is I'm well versed in all forms of motorsport standard but there might be some people out there that don't know you might, they might have never heard of the Dakar the majority of people have so so explain the Dakar in in <laughs> layman's terms it says well it's a desert rally for motorcycles cars lorries various different vehicles you know, um, on a terrain is kind of sand dunes, desert, uh, as well as other parts with with boulders linked in there with, you know, and, and unfortunately, when you're setting off on two wheels, you know, if you're setting off towards the back, obviously you're a slower 
a slower rider or a newcomer, then you haven't got very many minutes before the cars are setting off or the, or the lorries. So mm -hmm. it's uh, which is another massive danger and causes big uh, big clouds of sand. You can't see visibility and various things. But you know, James James will know better than me. I haven't competed at, at the Dakar, but obviously when it comes to rallying, if you if you think of rally cars, they've got a co-driver, they're directing them. You're on a motorbike. You don't have a passenger. No. So how are you? You've got, how are you? Well, you've got to try and read it. You have the road book on a on a yeah. scroll on on a, on a display in front of you. So you have to really try to uh, read as you ride, which is easier said than done. You know, when you're on a tarmac road reading your sat nav, had trying to get to the the north coast or whatever, and, and on a, it it's not quite like that because yeah. you've got all sorts coming at you on the on the off road terrain that you're trying to sort of. Um, avoid or ride around and uh, or prepare for something coming up but i would say you know having only just come into it they've it, and from what speaking to other people it's really come on a lot you get a lot you have a real loud uh, bleeper on your so providing your that that's that's sort of controlled by a, a gps thing so it knows where you are so providing you're on the right route it will warn you of any drops on right. that route as such so you know i've heard i heard horror stories of people who were think they're riding on their road book to a, to a degree and and um but they're 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 off route and they've they've hit a drop off that's not on the road book because they're on the they're not yeah. on the road book you know so you've uh, you've got to be on every point of a kilometer you've got to be checking that that road book to make sure you're on track you know obviously in the sand you get tracks of other bikes but that could be everyone could be going the right direction wrong direction yeah. or, or not everyone but there could be a, you could be following some tracks, tracks that have gone the wrong way yeah. because and you have to be accurate because there's various waypoints you have to connect with to, yeah, to link you into the, to the competition yeah it's more mental yeah, mentally right. draining than physically that that you know and it's two weeks so you know you do six this this one coming up in January is six days on and then you get a day off uh, and then another six days and it's you know I was I wouldn't say I was by, by, by nearly broken, but it, it, I did the one I did in Abu Dhabi was five day rally, and and you know that that was pretty tough. So sort of double that up, um, yeah. It. Uh, so are you still pursuing? Yes, yeah. I mean, still the, as it stands at the moment, you know, we're, we're what we at uh, nearly end of August. The entry is in. My uh, first deposit's paid, and my I've got a slot in Dakar January. So, you know, we're fair bit further ahead than we were this time hey, I've told you before I want a job in the team yeah I've got <laughs> you've, I'll put you on the list huh? there's a lot of people you know I think for in motorsport it's a, it is a it's an incredible event and, and also it's just so different isn't it? so road racing I think yeah. the mentality is somewhat similar you know but um, you know I'd, I, yeah I just I just want to get to the end. Obviously, get to the start is the hard. It's, it's almost the harder bit, I think. But um, I really just hope it all falls through and we can. I can get to the end of that Dakar and then uh, and see. As I say, I'll either I'll either hate it and never want to go near it again, or or um, you know want to do it again. So we'll see. Do you think any of your skills transfer across from the Dakar? Like once you start riding that a bit more and you focus on it, do you, do you think you can bring any of those skills, bike handling skills, across onto the, I think the TT the, course? Or? some possibly like the the brain speed thing of how your eyes are working and the, the it was funny actually the the rally I did in 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 uh, Spain there was a long section and it was it was absolutely flat and top gear and for me it was it you could see a fair bit ahead but there was um, a group of three other guys who would who would quick they'd come past me actually on the technical stuff but we got to this bit <laughs> they were they were like rolling and uh holding back a little bit and I was like what are they doing? I was just like, <laughs> I was like head down, just stream past them and checked out. And then uh, they got me back up again in the technical bit. But yeah. that was like, for me, it was like a TT section. I was yeah. gone, you know, um, <laughs> uh, and it felt, it didn't really feel fast, but I could imagine for them, it was the opposite. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, so the speed in some sections is, is there, but you know, I think my, when you've kind of gone the speeds we do here is the, the, the hundred mile an hour you do on a rally bike is, isn't anything, but, when you're doing 100 mile an hour in iffy terrain, then that's worse than doing 200 mile an hour here, I can mm. assure you. <laughs> yeah. Right, let's wrap up part one of this podcast. Join us for part two, where we're going to be discussing that moment of Balagheri, because we can't not, family life, and probably more chat about rallying, I guess. <laughs> Bucket list. Bucket list. <laughs> <laughs>